We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake and uh, showing in the SCC area, also SPNN. We're live, this is St. Paul area. We're glad to have you here. And tonight is gonna be about the elections. And, and the election results, but of course you know this show is about judicial reform, accountability, about family law reform, uh, building the foundation of our families. So this show is going to deal with how this election affected those areas and what we may see, what we're looking at seeing potentially uh, that's going on um, in the, not only the U.S., Senate, House, nationally, but locally also. Now, this show is mostly local stuff. That's the intent. But uh, today we are going to go into the national uh, speak, uh, the national thought that has taken place from the president and then Speaker Boehner in the House. Who knows if he'll be the speaker next year. He is of, as of now. He probably has the votes already counted as to whether he'll be the speaker, and it sounds like Boehner and Mitch McConnell will be the speakers and House leaders. Um, didn't turn my phone off here. Uh, so uh, at least they're talking like it, but who knows? They haven't taken the vote yet, uh, but it will come, and it sounds like they're going to be the leaders. But So I just want to... We're going to lay it out nationally and bring it down to the local level. Also during the show, um, if you have comments about any election fraud that you sh saw, keep your short story very short, about a minute. Uh, let us know uh, what you saw. And so we'll just kind of weave that in between everything else that's going on here. Um, over the next month, because we're gearing up, for a new legislative season. A uh, couple of the shows that we're going to have on are going to be dealing with um, election fraud. We're going to have a, the uh, ex-mayor of Harris, Minnesota. He's involved in a number of lawsuits that Eric Cardle uh, is the attorney for in Minnesota Vo Voters Alliance, Minnesota Majority is part of. So we're going to watch, uh, uh, he, he's going to explain the situations that he saw and experience and why there's lawsuits going on at the federal level relating to Minnesota and state level here. Um, also family law reform. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, there's a group of people basically it's 10 people against joint physical custody or shared custody and 10 people for it and Governor Dayton set up this task force and basically gave them the instructions, if you can come to any family law and you come, every single person out of this 20 group agrees that these laws should be changed, I'm going to sign the bills. They're going to get passed, I'm going to sign them. And that's pretty much the agreement. You got uh, Republican senators and, uh, and House people on, on each side of the aisle in this committee, but you also have um, what they consider, what's the terminology that's used out there? Uh, the interest, not interest groups, uh, interested parties, not, not really that either, but they have a special term, which basically means the, the, the people that make the money in, the, in that particular industry, stakeholders. You know, and mostly stakeholders are people who are making the money, they're not the people being affected by the policies. And it's very hard as a person being affected by the policy to become a stakeholder. It's usually a government-run bureaucrat that's a stakeholder. And it's just fascinating. In other words, so dealing with the family is going to be a government social worker versus a parent and versus the child. Um, so parents and children have very, very little say, but the government stakeholder who need, has this job and is getting paid has the say. Um, but actually this is, uh, from what I see, it's a balanced group and they've come to resolution on I think about 17 issues. Some are significant, some aren't, um, but that's, we're going to have a show on that and some of the stakeholders uh, that were involved in it on the show. 
Also, health care, you know, the baby, another show is going to be about baby uh, DNA. Right now, as a parent, uh, your baby's DNA is being taken, and uh, the state has it. They're going to do whatever they want with it, do all kinds of research, and you have no control over your own DNA. You can't even make money off your own DNA. Uh, and it's a, it's a tragic situation for just individual rights, for property rights, and for you as a sole person, an individual in a, of yourself, uh, you just have no say. It's, it's amazing. So we're going to look at how is this going to deal with now that Minsure, who's a financial broken system and your health insurance rates are going up, you don't get to see your own doctor, you don't um, have say over your DNA, your children's DNA, and uh, how is the house, how are the people that want liberty, want you to have your own property rights, uh, how are they going to handle uh, this next two years. Uh, also then on the education level, because this deals with parental rights too, how is education going to be dealt with? Is Common Core, uh, we'll be talking about Common Core again, and I was just talking to somebody last night in Florida, Jeb Bush's area, who was, uh, Jeb Bush is a big proponent of Common Core curriculum, uh, which is, is not a government-run system, it's a corporate-run system. So the corporations are trying to get the government to push this system, which is really a dumbing down of the students um, and pushes away an individual for um, their own growth. Um, so you, everybody's going to kind of be at the same level. Um, so it's a matter of lowering people and raising some, lowering a lot, raising some, just setting the standards at a different level. Uh, so we'll talk about that and then of course the parental rights constitutional amendment I'm going to bring that up a little bit here at the beginning on the national level but we'll lay out what that means because there will be a push in the US Senate and House to have an amendment to the Constitution uh, putting in and guaranteeing parental rights uh, the right to raise your children in the upbringing and education of the parents choice rather than the states. And of course, um, if you're forced to go to one school and you have parental rights, but there's only one choice for you to go to a school, what kind of choice is that? So uh, that whole issue has to be put to bed uh, as far as just public schools. And we got to expand to not just public and charter and private and homeschool, but uh, you basically get to go to the school that you want and you can't if you don't have money you can't just be forced to a charter school or a public school uh, you could have you need to have more options because most parents would opt out of public schools and they'd opt out of charter schools and they'd have their own different school uh, that would reflect their values and that's not happening and I think that's why we're losing a lot of we're losing the youth to understand the governmental process, to understand what liberties are, what freedom is about, and the kids don't know it and they're voting against themselves. <laughs> That's what's taking place. All right, okay, let's get into the election results. Um, and remember, there's the call-in number there, 651-747-3838 and you can uh, watch past shows youtube.com backslash speechless mn and if you don't want to do it well or you can e email me speechless mn at gmail.com if you've got ideas for future shows or comments or questions or whatever just to say hi uh, please do that too we're going to start this kickoff of uh, the show with listening to what uh, our U.S. President Barack Obama had to say about the election results and then we're going to make a few comments and then we're going to hear what uh, House uh, Minority Leader right now, Speaker, uh, excuse me, House Majority Leader, Speaker of the House Boehner has to say. Uh, so let's hear what President Obama has to say. Obviously Republicans had a good night and they deserve credit for running good campaigns. 
What stands out to me, though, is that uh, the American people sent a message, uh, one that they've sent for several elections now. They expect the people they elect to work as hard as they do. They expect us to focus on their ambitions and not ours. They want us to get the job done. All of us in both parties have a responsibility to address that sentiment. Uh, still, as president, I have a unique responsibility to try and make this town work. So to everyone who voted, I want you to know that I hear you. To the two-thirds of voters who chose not to participate in the process yesterday, I hear you too. All of us have to give more Americans a reason to feel like the ground is stable beneath their feet, that the future is secure, that there's a path for young people to succeed, and that folks here in Washington are concerned about them. So I plan on spending every moment of the next two plus years doing my job the best I can to keep this country safe and to make sure that more Americans share in its prosperity. It's time for us to take care of business. There are things this country has to do that can't wait another two years or another four years. There are plans this country has to put in place for our future. And, and the truth is, I'm optimistic about our future. I have good reason to be. I meet Americans all across the country who are determined and big-hearted and ask them what they can do and never give up and overcome obstacles. And they inspire me every single day. So the fact is, I still believe in what I said when I was first elected six years ago last night. For all the maps plastered across our TV screens today, and for all the cynics who say otherwise, I continue to believe we are simply more than just a collection of red and blue states. We are the United States. And whether it's immigration or climate change or making sure our kids are going to the best possible schools to making sure that our communities are creating jobs, whether it's stopping the spread of terror uh, and disease to opening up doors of opportunity to everybody who's willing to work hard and take responsibility. The United States has big things to do. We can and we will make progress if we do it together. Uh, and I look forward uh, to the work ahead. All right. What, what's interesting here, of course, there's a lot interesting. Uh, I'm just making a few notes here. Maybe we can make these notes together. Uh, speaking of togetherness, uh, what togetherness did Barack Obama have with the uh, House uh, or with the Senate? The only togetherness was him and him alone and his orders to Harry Reid to make sure nothing got passed and everything got blocked and not to hear amendments to any of the bills, constitutional or not. There was only 19 amendments in the last two years to any bill. That's not a debate, that's not a discussion. Over 300 bills were put at the Senate from the House to discuss and Harry Reid did nothing with those. And so there was not this working together. They did not have this togetherness. It wasn't there. Um, and Harry Reid blocked all these bills that were passed by the House. They could take those bills, they can have a debate, they could amend them, they can change them, and they can bring them back to the House, but they didn't do it, uh, especially the budget bills. Budget bills have to originate in the House. They can't originate in the Senate, and then the Senate has to change the House bills, and then you bring it back. There was not that debate. Uh, there was no togetherness, and for President Obama to go and say we got to do it together and all these people out there now that have lost are saying we got to do things together and this was a message about being bipartisan. No, it wasn't. This is about getting something done and having somebody make a decision where the Senate did not make a decision for all these years, two years. Remember the Democrats had full control over the House and the Senate and the presidency for two years. They passed the Obamacare. They didn't do their immigration. They could have. They didn't do climate change. They could have. Um, you know, what, what's going on here? So to come back and, and, and 
blame it on somebody else, it's their own fault. They had the time, they could have done it, they didn't want to, and so the whole purpose here is to blame any future thing that's passed or not passed on the Republicans for not getting any immigration or not doing climate change or dealing with disease or terror or whatever. I, I mean, it's just outrageous, but that's the game that goes on and you gotta be able to see that. Um, first of all, uh, who is he, wh what is he hearing from the people that didn't vote? I mean, what are you hearing from crickets chirping? What message are they sending? There was no message sent. Either they didn't care, which you know what? Most of the people that I talk to that didn't vote, they say, I don't care, or <laughs> I can't, you know, the people I tried to get to vote the most that in, in my circle that I deal with, um, they didn't care. I don't care who's running the show. I can't make a difference. Um, and it doesn't matter who I vote for anywhere, they're both the same, so I'm just not voting. So what, what message, I mean, that's to a person. So what message did President Obama hear? I mean, from those who didn't vote. You know, it's either I don't care or nothing's gonna change. So that's all he could have heard. Maybe he heard something else, but we don't know what he heard because he wouldn't say it. And that was very important in what he talked about because there was no details about what he was trying to deal with until the very end, which was immigration and climate change. And that's not what people are talking about. And we're gonna hear Speaker Boehner give out five things that the Republicans are gonna focus on, and, and I like some of these, okay? Uh, so, let's see what else is here. Let's get the job done. We got a unique responsibility that, uh, look, look, President Obama ignored his responsibility over and over and sent a message to um, Harry Reid, just block stuff. We are on automatic pilot, and this is the bad news about this election, is that there's an automatic pilot going on the budget, on policies, and in, in Minnesota, we're there. So if nothing changes, the automatic, it just gets worse, okay? And because there is not a Republican majority in the governorship in Minnesota, uh, we gotta wait for the Senate to turn over. We're gonna look at four years now for there to be any change uh, in Minnesota. Uh, regarding health care and policies, unless it gets so bad that the Democrats have to change their vote. And it is bad. Um, the, the loss of liberty has been extreme. Um, and it was done in the House. Why it wasn't done at the uh, governor level and at the uh, state level elections, uh, you know, I don't know. Something's going on. I don't know what it is. Uh, part of it was probably bad marketing by the Republicans because they didn't hammer down some of the big issues of debt, um, Obamacare. They just didn't deal with it good and they didn't hammer down. So uh, getting the job done, you know, I don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, it's time to take care of business now. Well, you had the majority. You could have taken, business, taken care of business. You could have compromised. And so all you're going to do now over the next two years is saying the Republicans won't compromise. When you had the presidency, you had the Senate, you wouldn't compromise with the House. You did nothing to compromise. And now you're going to say Republicans won't compromise when you go way overboard. Um, that's going to be the story that President Obama is going to give. Now, in contrast, let's hear what... Uh, Representative, uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Bonnier has to say, and he gives a little different uh, story. So let's hear what he says is gonna happen. I'm gonna start by congratulating uh, my friend, Senator Mitch McConnell. As you know, uh, Mitch and I have uh, worked uh, very closely together over the last eight years. And uh, I don't think I could ask for a better partner or uh, do I think the Senate could have a better majority leader than Mitch McConnell? I also want to express my gratitude to uh, the people of Ohio's 8th Congressional District. You know, my mission is the same today as it was uh, in 1990 when I was first elected uh, to build a smaller, 
less costly and more accountable government here in Washington, D.C. And right now, I believe that means continuing to listen, to make uh, the American people's priorities our priorities, and to confront uh, the big challenges that face middle-class families, uh, starting with the economy. You've heard me talk uh, many times about the many jobs bills uh, that the outgoing Senate majority has ignored. Those bills will offer the Congress, I think, a new start. We can act on the Keystone Pipeline, restore the 40-hour work week that was gutted by Obamacare, and pass uh, the Hire More Heroes Act uh, that uh, would encourage our businesses to hire more of our veterans. And again, this is just a start. Uh, I've been going around the country uh, outlining my own personal vision for how we can reset America's economic foundation. Uh, the energy boom that's going on in America is real, and I think it provides us with a very big opportunity. But to maximize that opportunity, I believe that we need to do five things, and that is uh, fix our broken tax code, address the, the debt that's hurting our economy and, and imprisoning the future of our kids and grandkids, uh, reform our legal system, uh, reshape our regulatory policy to make bureaucrats more accountable, and give parents uh, more choices in a system that isn't educating enough of America's children. Now, finding common grounds can be hard work, uh, but it'll be even harder if the president isn't willing to work with us. Yesterday, we heard him say that he may double down on his go-it-alone approach. So I've told the president uh, before, he needs to put politics aside and rebuild trust. And rebuilding trust not only with the American people, uh, but with the American people's representatives here in the United States Congress. Now, this is the best way to deliver solutions, uh, to get the economy going again, uh, and to keep the American dream alive and well. Uh, this will be the focus uh, of our new majority, and I'm eager to get to work. All right. Uh, I thought that was a great outline of, well, one, I liked it, so that's why I think it's great, but um, it just laid out what they look at doing. And the five things they were looking at in general categories to fix the tax code, um, deal with the debt, uh, reform the legal process. I, that was number three, reform the legal process. And, of course, that's why I wanted to bring this up on the show is obviously at the U.S. government level, they think the legal process, the judiciary, something's not going right. Um, so reform there, although, although I don't know what their intent is in that area. Uh, dealing with overburdensome regulation, um, especially you've got, Ob Ob well, Obama had put on a lot of regulation, tons of regulation that was burdensome and onerous. And the fifth thing there dealt with parents and parents having say over their families and education and education choice. Uh, I thought that was real interesting that ended up being number five on his list. Um, but there has been a push. The House has heard the um, constitutional amendment on parental rights. They've had at least two hearings on that. And now who's going to be the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee? Uh, I don't know, but the Senate will probably have a hearing on this. Then it's a matter of do we get two-thirds of the House and the Senate membership signing on to this bill, and then it would do, do we get two-thirds of the state? So this will be a very important issue uh, uh, coming up uh, over the next two years to see how well this parental rights constitutional amendment will work. And of course, we're going to have a show on that later. Uh, but just the Senate race itself had a big effect on appointed judges to the Minnesota, uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so the Republicans are in control. Some of the judiciary, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, justices like Ginsburg were probably looking for a Democrat Senate. Actually, she may retire here in the next three days. And, um, excuse me, in the next two months. She may retire so that Obama could appoint 
um, and still have a democratically controlled Senate go on uh, and give the um, confirmation. And that would be done speedily. Um, that'd be interesting to see if that takes place. That's kind of hanging in the balance. Otherwise, if she resigns next year um, or in the next two years, there's a there'd be a bigger fight. Maybe we'd get a more moderate justice or, uh, who, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But that's a big issue that came out of this election with the Republicans winning the Senate as to how much they are going to preserve the Constitution, uh, preserve liberties with the type of justice that they give their advice and consent on to the president and whether they will give it or not. So uh, that's a big, big issue. Uh, also, parental rights um, will be heard in the Senate. Uh, another issue is treaties on the persons of the rights with disability is probably um, gone. That will not pass a Republican Senate uh, for the very reason that this treaty was unique in so many ways. In one in particular, it, for the first time, it would be a treaty that would tell the uh, Minnesota states, uh, the outside countries can come in and tell the states uh, how they had to treat people with disabilities and it took away parental rights not only to the medical care of their children but just say over just education. It just it was a backdoor way to circumvent our Constitution and the people of the United States having say over their own families. Um, here's another thing that's interesting is, so I, I mean, so that treaty on the persons with disability, that's out of the picture. It didn't pass. Uh, the last two years, there weren't enough votes. Um, you had to have the 66 votes. That didn't come about. Who knows what they're going to try to push in the last two months. Um, but if that's one they're trying to push, I don't believe they'll have the votes for that. So that one's gone for a while. I'll be very interesting to see who's on that Judiciary Committee. Instead of covering up for bad justice like Klobuchar and Franken did, they were both on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, it's going to be a no whole new ballgame in the U.S. Senate. Now here's one other big thing that's going to happen uh, with the uh, Senate is that, and you're hearing this with this togetherness, we need to work together. <laughs> is, you know, Democrat, exp are, they're expecting the Senate rules that they changed, they used them, this nuclear option, they expect the Senate rules to revert back to give the minority more power. You know, Senator Reid and the Democrats had changed them to eliminate Republican influence. Of course, they did that so that they couldn't go out and get, um, have debate. And, and it was just going to be forced down people's throats and people couldn't hear a debate, they couldn't hear people speak, and they're expecting the new Senate to go out and change the rules back to the way they were. I think there's just going to be a little bit um, of uh, gamesmanship going on here, and, you know, it was just a bad, bad decision by Harry Reid to do that. Another reason why Franken should be out of there because he's not a straight shooter, he's not a fair player. Um, and with this nuclear option, you couldn't filibuster the ju judiciary appointments. You couldn't have that open discussion, you couldn't filibuster them. And so um, we'll see what's going to hap happen here. <laughs> it's a big issue. Uh, but we did get a message from uh, the parentalrights.org and what they thought was going to happen, and they think the Senate changes was very positive because the president for a constitutional amendment is not a factor. He doesn't get a say. It's just the senators, the House, the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, and then the states as to whether if they pass it, then it goes to the states for a vote uh, in a two-thirds of the... the uh, states pass the constitutional amendment, then it's put on. So all the cards are in the right place right now to get this done, except it's going to have to be bipartisan. It should be anyway, 
And it was interesting to note that all the people who signed on to the, in the House and the Senate to the constitutional amendment, they all won their election. So they're still all in the game. That doesn't mean that if everybody would have signed on, they would have won their race, but it's just what happened. Uh, but as long as Harry Reid was in the Senate, there was no chance of the parental rights bill being passed. It, there wasn't going to be a floor vote. There wasn't going to be a hearing. Uh, they've worked and talked against the parental rights. Not all of them, but some of the Democrat senators said, hey, I'd like to sign on. I'm not going to be able to do it right now. It's, um, it's the, it would just be too much pressure from the Democrat leadership uh, to sign on to this bill. So there are some that want to. We'll see if they do it now. But this will raise to a level to be uh, a political issue that should be get out in the press. And I think it's something that will force the hands of these uh, uh, Democrats who believe in family, uh, believe in the importance of the family, uh, that this will force them to sign on. Well, who knows? Who's going to see? I, I, you know, at least it's going to get to the level where it's going to get some national attention instead of being behind the scenes and the press doesn't cover it. Now maybe the press will cover it, besides me, of course. Um, so it's got to be bipartisan support, and parental rights are a bipartisan issue. Uh, and uh, this is not about, you know, the Republicans over the Democrats. This is just about being able to get this to the table. And hopefully now the Democrats will have the freedom to sign on to this bill. Um, so um, it was also interesting to note that those that signed on to the Parental Rights Amendment the average win in their races was 65.5%. I mean, they just won by that much. So we'll see what the future brings. But what does that do now? Uh, that's the national level. We'll spend a lot of time on that. I want to give some input on the Minnesota races, and especially the Supreme Court races. And then Washington County, there's a few races there, and just the results of that. Um, of course, if you've been watching the show at all, you know that I uh, was behind Michelle McDonald for the Supreme Court and uh, did work to make sure she got endorsed. And I'm sad but happy she didn't win, but I'm happy to let you know out of the endorsed Republicans, she got the highest percentage vote, vote total. She didn't get the highest vote total, she got the highest percentage vote total. So at 46.54%, uh, Michelle McDonald got 680,000 votes and change. Uh, she lost uh, by 97,000 votes. Um, so in the, in the judicial races, the vote total was just short of 1.5 million votes. Um, and it's interesting, the other Supreme Court race, of course, you had Michelle McDonald versus David Lillyhog. Um, then you had John Hancock versus Wilhelmina Wright as the other race. Now, John Hancock did not do any campaigning. He didn't spend any money. He didn't talk to it. Michelle McDonald spent very, very little money, too. She got a lot of press. Uh, for her fake DUI charge, which she was found not guilty of. But on her John, Han uh, John Hancock, who did nothing, uh, got 633,000 votes. He was not the incumbent. Of course, the judges have the incumbent word behind their name, and that gives them a heads up. It's very difficult to beat that name. By the way, no incumbents got beat. No incumbents lost election in Minnesota this year. Get rid of that name, incumbent behind the ballot, I think we'll see a different ball game and it'll be a more level playing field and more people will enter the race for judge. 
and, there's a, and I'm sure that bill's going to come up through the House <laughs> uh, this next year. Uh, so John Hancock, who did not campaign, still got just short of 43% of the vote. So um, with Michelle campaigning and having some press, she had an extra 3.5% than John Hancock, who did nothing. Um, there was John Hancock lost by 204,000 votes. Michelle McDonald lost by 97,000 votes. Part of this could be because of women just voting. There's a woman's name will vote for you. And I've heard stories, you know, when you're an election judge, at times you get to see and hear why people do ballots and you have situations where um, uh, people, for whatever reason, you're there helping them out and they're just giving you your rationale. <laughs> and I heard somebody vote straight down the line DFL. And of course, Lily Hogg, was, uh, who was appointed by Dayton, Everybody know Lily Hogg's DFL, but this this guy voted for everybody DFL except Michelle McDonald. Voted for Michelle McDonald, um, but uh, Lily Hogg definitely DFL, uh, and he had a campaign fund. Uh, he did campaign. He was getting a lot of endorsements by attorneys. Uh, so. I think one issue that why Michelle did better than John Hancock, who didn't campaign because of the name. McDonald, Irish name, probably got the Irish vote in there. Also that she was a woman. Wilhelmina Wright got the most votes by about uh, 50,000 extra votes than David Lillyhaw got. Uh, was that because she was a woman? Uh, but that's kind of the difference, you know, What's going on there? We don't know, and everybody's reasons is, is, is different. I know people didn't vote for McDonald because she had the DUI charge, which she was found not guilty of. Okay, and uh, that didn't didn't make sense because they didn't think through the process in my mind. So the big thing here is that the incumbents won across the board uh, in, in this race. What was also interesting, you know, from the governor's race and from the Senate race, there's a big drop off on the judicial races because that's the judiciary doesn't want the judges to campaign. They've tried to discipline attorneys in the past. There's been many lawsuits about lawyers campaigning for the judiciary. They try, the state bar tries to force them to sign a, a, uh, form that says they will not campaign, they will not talk about issues, which they have the right to do. And it's just amazing uh, the persecution that goes on for the lack of free speech in the court. And they won't let you film in the court, which by the way, we're getting closer to a lawsuit coming into play with that issue. But what was also interesting, there's about 1.5 million votes for the Supreme Court. When you went down to the appellate court level, the next level, um, the drop-off in votes, there was about a 300, 313,000 vote drop-off. No, there was no contested races in the appellate court. And it seemed that the higher you were on the ballot, because they put it by seat, the lower the, the vote total got down to the bottom. In other words, people started filling it out and going, wait a sec, nobody's running here. Ah, why fill it out? I don't know who they are anyway. So I vote for somebody that's not running. Statewide race, 350, around 300,000 less votes. Okay, we got a call coming in here. Caller, do you have a comment, question? Jim Kinley. Hey. Thank you for this uh, great analysis. I've heard, you know, I've heard a little bit on the Minnesota Public Radio yeah. and a little bit on the TV stations, read a little bit in the paper, and your analysis is more comprehensive, more in-depth, more explanatory than any of these other guys, which is mm -hmm. all kind of phony and uh, uh, political. They seem right. to all have their political angles they're trying to make already running for the next election. Hey, the question I have on this uh, get out the, vo the vote, was there a sample ballots with this Michelle McDonald on, or was there sample ballots or telephone calls 
made for David Lillehog. Was there any sort of, uh, or for Frank and Dayton and uh, Lillehog? Did you see any of those uh, sure, cards? Sure, Was right. any of that on or anything like that? Thank right. you. Yeah, it was interesting. The Democrats don't endorse for judge. Okay, so but they do do the sample. They do the sample ballots, but they endorse don't endorse. But on getting out the vote, I've heard from a number of Democrats that um, they said vote for David Lillyhog. So on their call script, they were telling people to vote for David Lillyhog. <laughs> okay, um, but they didn't endorse him. So here you have the Republicans that endorse for judge and, and endorse Michelle McDonald, but they wouldn't put her on any of the literature. They refused to do that. They went against the unanimous endorsement by the uh, delegates of the, uh, at the state convention. They refused to put her picture and her name on who to vote for to the Republicans and they left her off the call script, although a number of districts and a number of people who were calling were saying, hey, Michelle McDonald's endorsed Republican, and they did it against the Republican leadership's uh, whip, uh, authoritative, uh, we don't care, of course, as we heard in a recording in a prior show, we don't care what the delegates think. You know, you're going you're gonna to do what we tell you to do, not what the delegates tell you to do. Uh, so this, was a, this is a big underneath-the-scenes battle inside the DFL and the Republican Party. Only the DFL plays it smart. We don't need to endorse you, Judge. We'll just get all our people to say we endorse you, and the message will be sent. Oh, if... Uh, Senator Franken endorses you, Judge, and we got Senator Franken and Governor Dayton's name on your uh, endorsement, along with other key mayors and, and Democrats. Uh, people will get the picture that you're being endorsed by the uh, Democrat Party. So, uh, final answer, uh, the Republicans did not put her on her mailing, and that's too bad. She could have won. Uh, easily could have picked up that extra 100,000 votes, and they didn't do it, and they just, you know, it's one of the reasons they bite themselves, uh, kick themselves in the foot on these national races, so it's, or these statewide races, it's just too bad. Okay, um, so let's go into Washington County. There was two contested races, both people going against incumbent judges, and one race was uh, Susan Miles, the incumbent judge, versus Julie Lafleur, and it was 127,000, about 128,000 to 102,000. Susan Miles, the incumbent, won. And then uh, Nancy Lagering, the incumbent judge, versus Stacey Lashinsky, uh, 120,000 votes to 107,000 votes. So a little tighter race there. Um, but two things. One, I want you to notice there's about 230,000 votes total for the contested races. For the uncontested races, there was a drop off of about 48,000, 48 to 50,000 people who didn't vote for the uncontested races. Um, and they're smart to do that, um, but let's have some contested races. <laughs> you know, that just, that just needs to happen. Uh, but remember, the judiciary and the state bar is fighting against freedom of the press, freedom of, uh, and freedom of speech uh, for the judiciary. And they put a lot of pressure on the judges not to do anything, uh, not to run, and, not, and they'll punish you if you run against the sitting judge. So to run against the sitting judge is, um, it's a big step to take, and you need to have some support because your practice is probably going to hurt after you run and lose. 
and in this state, everybody who ran against a sitting judge lost. There's actually one judge, I believe, in the 7th Judicial District, Stephen Cahill, who was disciplined by, and there's a couple Cahills, so you've got to be careful which ones you get, uh, disciplined by the Board on Judicial Standards, and um, he had an opponent, and that was a very close race. There was only like a 1% difference in the gap. The opponent still lost, but this judge is a bad actor. The Minnesota Board on Judicial Standards disciplined him and laid out what he had been doing. He shouldn't be sitting, but because people don't know about the judiciary and who these people are and what they're doing and it's not being exposed in the press, uh, these judiciary who are the bad actors get away with it. And so that's, you know, that's kind of what's going on there. Okay, um, let's get into the House elections here. Oh, by the way, in the second judicial district, Ramsey County, all the judges were unopposed. Uh, so there was no contested late, um, elections for the judiciary in St. Paul. That'd be St. Paul, Maplewood, the Ramsey County area, uh, Roseville, Shoreview, White Bear Lake, you know, the, as the, where this show is going live, uh, for, for most of it, uh, you didn't get to vote for a judge because nobody ran against them, and that's too bad. Okay, House elections. Of course, the Republicans took control of the Minnesota House. Tomorrow, they decide the leadership is going to be, and we're, it's going to be interesting to see whether it's the rhinos in the Republican Party or the more conservative end that takes the leadership because there was a lot of new uh, now they were saying there's new 11 new c candidates but I was looking through the list and um, I, th I thought I saw a lot a lot more like more like 22 but I'll have to recheck that a lot of names I didn't recognize um, the important thing here is with the House, they have the ability to impeach judges. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to me to see who's on the House Judicial Committee, uh, who's on the um, House Civil Law Committee, and because those and the uh, um, Public Safety Committee. Those three committees deal with all the family issues. So it's going to be interesting to see who's on those committees, and that will determine a lot of the effect of what will come out. Will, it, will they produce bills that will strengthen the family? Will they deal with the parental rights law that will be proposed, and there will be people down there pushing the parental rights um, bill for the state of Minnesota? Um, how, how are they going to behave? Um, but I'll, I'll let you know, though, like I talked at the beginning of the show, there are about, I don't remember the number, 12 to 17 bills that are already pre-approved <laughs> by Governor Dayton. Governor Dayton basically said, if you pass, if these 20 people, 10 against joint physical custody, 10 for shared custody, uh, if you 10 not like-minded people get together and come to a conclusion and say, here's the bills we need to change that will help out the family law. If you can all agree on the bills, I'll sign them. And so that's going to happen, you know. Uh, that, and so that's going to come out of the House Civil Law Committee, those bills. And I, my guess is Peggy Scott will be the chair of that committee. Steve Dreskowski will be the chair of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, I don't know what other person with the experience down there, uh, rather than Steve Jaskowski on the Judiciary Committee. Um, he's not an attorney, but that's a good thing. He's not beholden to them. They can't take his license away from him. Um, so I don't know who else they would put there. Public safety will probably be Tony Cornish. And the only changes on these would be if some of these, one of these guys were put up into the tax committee or the education committee to chair those, then that's what's going to 
uh, shuffle that deck around. But otherwise, you got good people running in the school committees. The other reason the family law committees, there are some good Democrats uh, that are for positive changes in our family laws, and that would be uh, Tim Mahoney, um, St. Paul pe person, and John Lesh. And others have come along kicking and screaming, but uh, they come along. So um, it'd be a big mistake by Dayton to go back on his word with all the agreements that are coming out. Just another issue on the statewide r issue of the House, uh, only one Republican gain in the metro area. All the rest were out of the state. Uh, and, you know, last year they didn't have anybody that knew about agriculture on the Agricultural Committee. And so uh, Kurt Doubt, who supposedly is going to be the Speaker of the House, who knows, they haven't taken the vote, but you kind of know ahead of time who's going to vote for who, uh, will have a, um, somebody from out state on the Ag Committee, somebody that knows about farming. So that would be a huge change. I just don't understand why the Democrats did that. Okay, um, so anyway, the House Elections Committee meets tomorrow, Friday, to decide who their leadership's going to be. I don't know that the committee chairs will be decided then. They may need to take more time on that. Um, and then we're going to be looking at the constitutional amendment for parental rights in Minnesota. And so a lot of activity going on and a lot of positive changes uh, coming up. Now, one thing I'm kind of detecting from the Democrats, well, nationally immigration, they're going to use immigration as their uh, bully pulpit and try to destroy the Republicans with immigration. But locally, the discussion a lot is about domestic violence and how we're going to end domestic violence against women. And that's really, they're starting to do that at the local level. Of course, Maplewood has talked about it. The Maplewood Human Rights Committee and the City Council have had discussions. Um, and of course, their facts are wrong. Um, and we've showed the show in the past that, you know, they're saying may, men are the overwhelming initiators of abuse. The studies have come out and said, no, they aren't. It's about equal. And if women wouldn't initiate the abuse, abuse amongst women would drop about 30%. Uh, a huge, you want to end domestic violence, you're going to end a significant amount by just not having women initiate uh, violence. So it will be a very interesting session. Uh, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, you, you go and channel 17, or the internet, you can watch these House committees, or you can go down to the Capitol and watch them. But I've sat in a lot of committees. You want to know the exciting committees? Exciting committees are the Civil Law Committee, dealing with family law, the Judiciary Committee, and the Public Safety Committees. Those don't get any press. The press is all on the taxes and the budget. Where's the money going to be spent, and who are we going to take it from? Those are the that that those are the committees that get shown on TV, but the more exciting ones are public safety, civil law, and judiciary. And we're going to see there's going to be a new change in, uh, you know, in the committees. How the Senate has their committees, the House will have their committees, how they're going to line up, that's going to be a whole new factor also. Uh, and then how's Governor Dayton going to ha handle all this? Um, is he going to be more like an Obama? Uh, or is he going to be more cooperative? Well, he had his chance on family law to uh, pass a, uh, a decent bill in the past that would give a presumption of 35% to fathers. He vetoed that, pocket vetoed, uh, just didn't sign the bill and it went away. And since the session was over, they couldn't override his veto, which both houses, the House and the Senate, were two votes away. Uh, from passing, overriding the veto, so the timing of that didn't work out, but he came up to this with the solution that if these two opposing parties of 10 each come to a like mind, then it's going to pass. I'll, I'll sign those bills. We'll see if he keeps his word on that, but there's been years 
of discussion on this for the last two years. And what was really interesting uh, from when we have one of our guests come on that was part of this process is the people that were against joint physical custody or shared parenting, uh, the dialogue was good enough and rich enough so that these people against fathers being involved in their children's life or, or just believed in the concept that one of the parents had to be ripped from the other parents from the child's life, you know, just have one major parent. They finally understood uh, what was going on and the pain that it was causing and the damage that it was doing to the children. So they had their ideology for whatever reason and that little piece of the puzzle, which is a significant piece, got broken through so that they saw that um, children need both of their parents, as long as they're good parents, involved in the children's lives and there needs to be a standard defining what a good parent is versus a bad parent and it's got to be a little bit higher than oh he's a man uh, he can't he doesn't know what to do and children need fathers and an um, overwhelming majority overwhelming majority of fathers are good fathers and want to be engaged in their children's life that's the bottom line okay thanks for watching the show we'll be back next week with more information uh, and remember if you don't stand up for other people's liberties who's going to stand up for Days yours and good people like don't do nothing God bless have a great week in the wind takes the kite as the firefly brings the light